Hello and welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graham Hill. Carol Kingston Smith co founded Justice Initiative with her husband Andy. They founded Justice Initiative in 2010 to focus Christian engagement on socio political, economic, and environmental issues. They head up a postgraduate program on justice, advocacy, and reconciliation, especially in intercultural contexts. Carol teaches justice and mission at Redcliffe College in Gloucester. She's a co author of Carnival Kingdom. The book Carnival Kingdom features the work of 20 scholars, theologians, and social activists from around the world. They call the church to justice and to a renewed society. Well, Carol Kingston Smith, mm. welcome to Being Missional. Thank w you. With your husband Andy, you fo founded the Justice Initiative. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us something about that work? Okay. Yeah, the, the Justice Initiative really was something born out of our own experience of being in mission mm. in Bolivia. Um, and then coming back to reflect on that uh, in, in further studies ourselves. And as we reflected and as we pursued reading and, and um, engaging with more missional um, studies, we began to feel that there just wasn't enough uh, happening in theological mm. and missiological training to prepare people going into contexts where there's a lot of justice issues. Mm. Um, so the Justice Initiative was just born out of a, a desire to reflect and engage more ourselves directly mm. with that. And we thought, well, why don't we just start sharing what we're thinking through? Yeah. So we set up the initiative very much as part of the work we were doing at Redcliffe College at the time, developing new courses and yeah. uh, an MA program, looking at justice and advocacy and reconciliation within the mission context. Hmm. How can Christians better engage with biblical paradigms of things like justice, advocacy or reconciliation? Hmm. Yeah, I think I think the the, the engagement begins mm. with actually being present to our communities and being um, a faithful presence, being uh, aware and attentive to what's actually happening mm. in our local communities, and that then needs to be reflected in in how we read the Bible and understand what the Bible's mm. message. Uh, to us in our context and I think in in terms of developing uh, understanding of how to engage with justice and advocacy and reconciliation that will be different in each and every context mm. and I think it's very important for local communities local churches to uh, reflect and discern that process of of what they're going to do in terms of how they're going to respond to the issues in their own context corporately ideally mm. Um, we're very used to rushing off and individually doing mm. things, but I think it's very good for churches to try and work corporately, discerning mm. and praying about how to impact local communities. I know that there's probably a whole range of biblical paradigms, mm. but can you think of so one or two of them that would be exemplify what we're talking about? Mm. Yeah, well, I think the the, the start the starting point is is very much the the creation narrative. Mm -hmm. it, it lays out for us a, a paradigm of the good creation, mm -hmm. and it's a holistic narrative which mm -hmm. reminds us that when we talk about justice, mm -hmm. we're not just talking about human uh, creation, but we're talking about the the complete in, um, uh, fauna and flora of creation. Um, so I think that's an important place to start when we think about mm -hmm. justice because it's a, it's the all encompassing holistic paradigm of God's good creation that he wants to restore. Um, and of course in the New Testament we, we read of, of the groaning of creation waiting for the sons of, of, mm. of man to be revealed. Um, and that restoration process is um, linking right through the scriptures to Revelation when there's a, the, the complete mm. restoration. Um, so that would be that would be for me the starting point. Then of course you've got the the development of the covenant people of the Torah and the giving of the law, the mm. jubilee principles, which are beginning to show us how that restoration of community, that called out community, that's released from the slavery to the imperial order of, of Egypt. And so that would be a paradigm of well, how then do we live in the, in the land mm. as the people of God. Um, and then of course there are other specific paradigms um, uh, for. Um, advocacy, for example, Esther, you have mm. um, the prophets, they're writing, Jeremiah, how to be faithful in the city, mm. praying for the blessing and the well-being of the city and living, um, mm. and Moses. So there, there are many advocacy par paradigms. Um, and reconciliation, you, you've got mm. stories like Zacchaeus, which look at forgiveness, restitution, restoration into mm. community. Um, and so on. I could mm. go on. <laughs> now, you partner with others in order to address issues of injustice. Can you tell us some of the partnerships that you engaged in? Mm. 
Yeah, I, I would say, first of all, that our partnerships are really uh, specifically specifically to um, enable the, the kind of the, the writing reflection, theological mm. reflection. We're, we're not on the ground practitioners, yeah. um, but we, we partner with practitioners to nourish the, the reflection and the teaching and the writing that we do. Mm. So, for example, when we were developing the master's programme at Redcliffe, we would be uh, looking to partner with organisations such as Christian Aid mm. and their advocacy department, um, International Justice mm. Mission, um, Care for the Family... Um, and, and tier fund and, and mm. other advocates, C- CMS, um, C- and CWS rather, and Christian Solidarity Worldwide, CSW, um, looking at how their expertise can feed into the the courses that we were running, so mm. that we could then develop the theological reflection based on the practitioners, what they were bringing to us and sharing with us about how they felt as Christians they should are called to work in that way. And then we mm. would use that as a partnership to help us th- reflect mm. and help the students. Um, and other partnerships that we do outside of, um, in, of uh, college training would be partnerships such as with the International Justice Mission, mm. where we're partnering with them to develop a training tool for pastors looking at um, understanding better the biblical narrative of justice mm. um, to help them develop their work uh, all over the world. Yep. Mm. What does it mean to develop clear frameworks for advocacy and reconciliation? Mm. Yeah, good question. Um, sometimes you write things uh, and they sound great, don't they? But uh, what does it actually mean in practice? Yeah. I think the, I think where, where we're trying to uh, the point we're trying to make is that we need to be quite intentional mm. about what we're doing. And very often we have these instincts that oh, we've got to do something. Mm. There's something that's happening in our in our in our society in our context, and we think we need to respond. Um, but when we talk about developing f- clear frameworks, it's more about an intentional theologizing about the issues that we're encountering. So it's beginning to look at our, uh, the, the injustice that we're, we're fr- fronting and beginning to develop a clear process of engaging. Well, what does the scripture say? How, how as Christians, are we called to live and be faithful presence and respond faithfully to this particular type of injustice? So the framework would be one of um, in- incarnational living, uh, followed by reflective scriptural reading, mm. and then looking to develop a response. Um, mm. In the discernment of the, as I said before, looking to discern that response within the community of the mm. church, the people of God. And how does the Christian understanding of justice mean more than just thinking about the spiritual world, but you're know, thinking about sociopolitics and economics and other things as well? Mm. Yes, I think think for for us we see that there's been uh, obviously we have a long history of dualism in our thinking where we've separated mm. out the spiritual and the material and I think um, what what we seek to do with the justice initiative is say there there's no separation it's all part of uh, what we call our salvation and our, our discipleship. Mm. Um, so for us, the, the work of the Spirit renewing and restoring our lives that mm. is part of discipleship is also uh, it, at one and the same time the same as our lives, walking out our lives in the world as we find mm. it and encountering situations, be they individual uh, relationships that have broken down that need restoring or be it that um, at, the large, at the structural levels of sociopolitical mm. uh, breakdown and injustice where we need to find a voice and respond mm. ideally as i said before at a corporate level that christians mm. come together and say this isn't uh, this isn't happening on our watch we need to respond as christians mm. being faithful presence to god's hope mm. and justice in the world in your book the carnival kingdom you say that the first christians embraced a new social order or they had a, a vision of a new social order mm. what, what did that look like mm. Um, I don't know, I would love to have been there, but we get some glimpses and um, I think a lot of it was about releasing the the faith to live as the people of God under Mm. uh, uh, imperial oppression, under Mm. other world views and Mm. to recapture some of what the the, the Torah teaching and and some of those ways of living as people in relationship, sharing um, and uh, looking after the orphan and the widow, Mm. recapturing and living faithfully and generously. 
Um, so I think for for those that were Jewish Christians, mm. they would have had a long history. They would have understood their history. For the Gentile Christians that were coming in, then in, in, integrating in that, they would have brought uh, different flavors as mm. to what that new social order would look like. But Paul makes it very clear to the mm. early church: there's no Jew nor Gentile that they were meant to begin to share their resources and uh, live as a community um, in an, a, a non-hierarchical, non. Um, uh, judgmental way against each other, mm. the, the inclusive community mm. sharing what they had. What's the image of the Carnival Kingdom all about? The image of the Carnival Kingdom is, is just, uh, for me, it, it was a, a fun motif that captured something of the joyful uh, breaking down of um, static hierarchies of power. Um, and the, the early medieval carnival was exactly about that. It was about mm. um, breaking open a space of festivity and enjoyment of human contact and relationships in a society that had become extremely stratified and unequal, mm. where the, the haves had it all and the, the have-nots were eking out mm. living. Um, and for that day of the carnival, there was this reconnection of people who had been separated by this very hierarchical, mm. static order. And in that coming together, they were experiencing something that they didn't ordinarily experience. And that was the joy and the mm. laughter of actually even touching each other mm. and uh, laughing together, eating together. The banquet was part mm. of, but laughter and joke and uh, revelry. Mm. Uh, now, of course, we're not promoting the excesses of the revelry mm. of the medieval carnival, but I think it does explore something about the joy of the mm. community of um, creation or the kingdom of God that we can experience as Christians uh, together, but that we should be modelling to the world a, a way mm. of relating um, that doesn't um, mimic the, the sort of the hierarchies of power where there are people who are disadvantaged by that and mm. mistreated under that. What are some practical ways that the church can live out this new social order? I think there are, each context will have mm. um, its own set of uh, challenges in terms of how to live this out. Mm. And I think that we all have to look to our own context and mm. say, well, what's going on in our context? Who are the people that have all the power? And who mm. are the people who don't seem to have much of a voice? Um, I think the, the picture of the banqueting table for me is a wonderful picture because when you come to a table, if everyone's at the table, not only are they all eating the same food, mm. but they're also all, they all have a voice. Uh, the ta banqueting table motif is one where people are able to actually share food, break food together, but also discuss and talk together and be equal in that process. And I think often in churches and communities, we find that not everyone is even getting to the banqueting mm. table. Not everyone is able to share the benefits mm. and the goods of community. Um, and not everybody is able, even if they get to the banqueting table, maybe they're they're not able to share or have a voice. Mm. And um, and I think that's that's the kind of thing we need to be looking mm. at in churches and communities. Who are the people who are getting, um, being excluded? So it's essentially mm. about inclusion and about uh, being family together. And I'm particularly concerned mm. to see us break down barriers between, be it ethnic groups, be it uh, socioeconomic groups, uh, and any other divisions that we experience mm. in our societies, I think we need to make a real effort as Christians to cross those borders which are, can be uncomfortable, mm. but which are very clearly borders we're meant to cross so that we have uh, Christian churches that have people from uh, that represent uh, who are in our communities, that we're not just a uh, white majority church in a mixed mm. community, for example, um, and so on. Mm. That would be one example. What are some other, the, uh, other issues that you address in your book? Well, the, the, the book Carnival Kingdom is a, a Biblical Justice for Global Communities is actually mm. a book that um, we've edited and it's a, it's a compilation of essays by people all around the world mm. um, 
my, my, in my chapter, the issues I've addressed very much are to do with the carnival motif, exploring what, what the upside down kingdom might look like, what, what kind of themes, laughter, sharing, joy and, and mm. uh, so on. But some of the other chapters contribute very specifically on issues of, for example, I- inequality. Um, or issues of what does shalom look like in practice? What 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 creative forms of advocacy? So looking at the, those themes of advocacy, how can we be salt and light? What are good models of advocacy? How can we speak uh, the life of, of Christ into our cultures? Um, and then we have contributions from other parts of the world looking at governance. What what is the Christian influence in governance? Um, from Melba Maggie in the Philippines, we have John Dial from India looking at um, issues issues of human rights, how can Christians be advocates within very difficult situations where human rights are uh, a great issue. Those are some of the examples. Mm. And what do you think is most misunderstood about the things that are said in that book? I think very often for Christians there's a sense in which we um, do not understand our place uh, in the public square. Mm. So we find sometimes we misunderstand how we can take up our voice in the public square. What role should we play? Um, and of course, Ecclesia is a called out community, but called to, to minister uh, in the public square and specifically to be part of the decision making mm. of the city. Um, so I think often Christians will be um, tentative about what what does that mean in practice, and of course we all have different gifts and different roles within mm. that. Um, so I think for different people there will be different things they misunderstand. Mm. Um, but I think essentially it's it's perhaps that we don't grasp just how mm. much um, freedom we have mm. to explore being salt and light in mm. the world and how our voice counts. There's a lot of discussion these days about the mission of the church and how the church can be missional in contemporary society. What is the mission of the church and how should it pursue that mission today? <laughs> yes, that's a very big question. Um, I think the, the, obviously there are many, many motifs of what is the mission of the church. For, for me, um, I, I like to see the mission of the church as bringing... Uh, hope to the nations and bringing the light of God to the nations and that can happen in many different ways um, but if if I if I consider the focus that we have in in our work in the justice initiative I think it's specifically about uh, ministering um, and bringing that message of, of, of justice and reconciliation uh, to to other to to our communities and our contexts, um, which for me is what discipleship mm. is actually about. Um, often we've narrowed some discipleship down to um, uh, an individual uh, exercise, mm. which is part of it. Mm. But I think we're called to disciple the nations, mm. and discipling the nations means to call the nations mm. back to God and to honouring God's principles that He's laid down for mm. living together in communities. And um, that would be, for me, what the mission of the church is actually all about. We're at the Micro Global Consultation at the moment, having this interview, and one of the phrases that's used a lot is integral mission. Do you like that phrase, or would you use something else? Yes, f- phrases. I- integral mission <laughs> is, is um, it's a good phrase in certain languages. Mm. Um, it works if you already understand what integral mission means. Mm. Um, so I haven't got a problem with using it as a phrase because mm. I understand and I've read about integral mission. Um, but I do understand that for people who, uh, in other language groups, it, it can be a problematic mm. phrase. But essentially I like the word holistic mission. Mm. I think that often uh, means immediately is accessible to mm. people in a way that perhaps integral mm. isn't without unpacking it. Um, so how would you define holistic mission? Four is about bringing the spiritual and material back mm. together again, where they belong, um, so that we are living lives uh, that are integrated, that we're not separating out um, mm. the spiritual from the material, so that as we carry the gospel, it will be carried um, in every form, as I say, in each context mm. we will be ministering and discipling who we encounter, what we encounter in that context. 
uh, so that it's integral, mm. it's integrated. And that will include proclamation, speaking out, always mm. being ready to defend the hope that we have. Um, but also it will include acts of service, um, advocacy, um, mm. and uh, working for justice as well mm. as the elements of building God's church. Does the Justice Initiative only work in the UK and Europe or in other parts of the world as well? Yeah, we, we are open to working anywhere. Yeah. Uh, and because a lot of our work is around developing mm. uh, tra- teaching and training mm. modules, um, we, we, we can, we can mm. do that. We're sort of flexible. Mm. Uh, obviously, our context and our base is in the UK and there are an mm. increasing number mm. of issues that we uh, would like to see addressed within the UK mm. context. Um, but because we've both um, been in mission in other parts of the world, mm. Um, we do have a, a real heart for the global mm. issues of, of justice, but we recognise that um, we need to partner with people who have got expertise mm. in those areas, so we reflect with people in those mm. contexts. And we're just interested in stimulating mm. conversations and stimulating Christians to engage mm. whatever context they're in. So it's being firelighters um, or yeah. catalysts, really. Yeah. I think we see our role in a sort of catalyst mm. way. This is another big question. But what do you think are the great challenges that are facing the church in the in the UK and Europe at the moment? Um, I, I mean, there are many challenges, but mm. I, I think, um, again, speaking from the context of the Justice Initiative, one of the mm. things that is high on our mm. list of challenges would be the, the issues at the moment of, of mm. migration, for example, how, how the church um, reacts and responds to that helps to set an example to mm. our nation. Um, we've got uh, growing inequalities, for example, in the UK, mm. um, which again is an injustice and we, we need to be addressing and speaking out. And then many mm. Christians are. There's a lot of very good work being done mm. in that whole area of economic inequality. Mm. We've got the, the global issues of climate mm. change and the need to put pressure on governments to to develop policies, to um, in, integrate political action uh, with speaking and acknowledging scientific mm. research, for example. Um, but these are all very big things. I think yeah. at the, the local church mm. level, we also have within our local communities the need to be present in our local communities and to be aware of what, what's actually happening in our local communities. Um, and though, though, though there are many churches that are doing mm. that very well and responding. Um, yeah. As you engage with local communities and the broader work of the Justice Initiative, where do you see signs of hope? Or where do you see God at work or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I'm always amazed mm. at how many people without having gone to theological college, without necessarily having a grasp, Mm. have got an instinct for uh, doing the right thing, which is Mm. what justice is actually all about. It's just simply about doing the right thing. Um, And and I I think there's a lot of hope in that. What What I see is that people want to do the right thing. They are positioned and want to help and live lives of integrity, but that they, they sometimes just need encouragement and they need to, to, to have some uh, direction in, in what to do and how to do it. So often, for me, the hope is actually in the fact that people often yeah. are good people. People are good yeah. and want to do things, and that gives me a lot of hope. Um, I do have a lot of hope for, for young people, but my yeah. concerns for young people is that... Um, the church needs to really look at how they form and create opportunities for young people mm. to explore. A lot of young people are very interested in issues of justice, um, but I'm not seeing enough done at the church level to mm. disciple and develop and nurture that hunger for uh, justice and developing their theology, mm. d- developing their reflection um, and engagement with that. So there's hope there, yeah. but there's work to do. What are some practical ways that we can help people engage in forms of discipleship that are addressing these kinds of issues? 
Practical things. Um, there's many course materials that are being put mm. out now. Um, uh, many organisations uh, are developing very good justice-focused mm. course material. And I think churches can stimulate their small groups by disseminating mm. and encouraging mm. small groups to study those things. Um, but I think a lot comes by actually... Um, talking to each other within churches, mm. acknowledging that we are in contexts throughout the week mm. where we're encountering injustice issues. So I think pastors, uh, small group leaders, stimulating that uh, dialogue with the, with people who are mm. actually out there in the world and, and looking to draw that back into the church, reflect and discern and pray mm. and encourage people. Often we've got all this richness of engagement in the world within the church, but I don't think we harness uh, and uh, nurture that as much mm. as we could do and pull that into our theological reflection as, as uh, communities mm. of, um, of God. Mm. So I think that's something we could mm. do more. What role do you see Micah playing in God's mission and in addressing injustices in the world? Well, as I understand Micah Global, as it is now, they're, mm. they're very much looking to facilitate and connect. Mm. And certainly my own experience as a very, very small mm. uh, new member of Micah um, is exactly that, that I feel connected to other people who are Christians, who have firm, committed faith, but who mm. also feel the need to speak the same mm. language as other people and by that I mean mm. that sometimes within churches if you're working in justice related mm. ministries um, you might feel that you haven't got people who understand what you're about at a local level so Micah I think provides a wonderful way of connecting and resourcing uh, people who are mm. working who might feel a bit isolated um, and under resourced so they disseminate information and resources and they're building mm. up their resources, their theological resources, mm. as well as their practical practitioner resources. Um, so I think they've got a wonderful role to play mm. um, by harnessing all that people mm. are doing across the world and then sharing that information around mm. the networks. I think it's a fantastic mm. role that it can play. Yep. Well, Carol Kingston-Smith, okay? thank you for joining us at Being Missional. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com. On our website you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.